and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to Advanced Echo Teaching this week. Uh, we are going to talk about the people's ventricle. We're going to talk about the right ventricle. Um, I think assessment of the right ventricle is one of the key things for learning Advanced Echo. There is no better way to look at the right ventricle in the critically ill. Uh, it's not always straightforward, but it's also not super hard. I would like to discuss the situations when I think you should go looking for it. I think it's important to know how to look for it and we've got various ways of doing it and I'll talk about the accuracy of some of those as we go. I do not have all the answers to how to manage it but um, I will give you a few ideas of where I think we need to look and where I think the evidence needs to start to grow and maybe that's where we all come in trying to work together to do what I think we need to do is big multi-centre studies looking into this and as I said to assess the right ventricle you need to know how to do echo and you need to have, know how to do it accurately. Okay, so the point is about when do you go looking for, and we'll start off with this, right? This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So I guess I use this as a, an example to say uh, if you're not looking for something, you're going to miss it. And I think before I started doing a lot of echo, I missed a lot of right hearts being abnormal. Um, you've got to know when to go and look for the right heart. And it's not just the poor cousin of the left ventricle. I think it's been labelled by in the past in some studies to say that the right ventricle is just a conduit to get to the pulmonary artery. Uh, and it's, you know, we've got animal studies that suggest that if you ablated the right ventricle free wall, it didn't really make any difference in the circulation. But that was done in dogs who were completely healthy for a very short period of time. And I think we all know that, and I, I can bring up lots of evidence to show it, that the right ventricle is extremely important. And if it's bad, you don't get blood going around the body. And if you've got a bad right heart uh, and you start to get venous congestion, you start to get core pulmonale, that's uh, associated with very bad mortality and things where like acute pulmonary and uh, like acute respiratory distress syndrome or setting peep and things like that. So we'll start off with a, a simple case, which I think demonstrates a few things quite elegantly in my opinion. So we had a 56 year old lady who came into our unit a couple of years ago. Uh, she came in with flu-like symptoms and breathlessness to an external hospital. And when she came in, she uh, was noted to have nasty respiratory failure, a horrible metabolic acidosis on the background of some risk factors that suggested she may have a right heart that would be at risk, such as smoking and COPD. She got intubated because she was agitated. She had escalating levels of support, both from an inotropic as well as uh, oxygen requirements as soon as she got intubated. And she was sent down to us and she had a monitor that looked a little bit like this when she came down in terms of tachycardia, hypotension on considerable amounts of uh, catecholamine support, hypoxic with very high CVPs. Um, the blood tests show that we've got someone who's got a raised white cell count. Maybe there's a pneumonia or an infective process underlying this. Maybe she's just sick. She's got a significant coagulopathy with an INR of 2.5. She's got some acute kidney injury, we think, uh, based on previous blood tests from a year or two ago showing that we've got urea and creatinins uh, that are both up. We've got uh, a metabolic acidosis with a bicarb of uh, 15. She's got LFT derangements, troponins off the charts up in the 10, 000, 11,000s, some electrolyte abnormalities and um, a blood gas that you can see here showing markedly arranged um, uh, lactate and pH. So all of these were put down at the external hospital coming through that this lady is sick. She got intubated, she suffered a non-STEMI, and now she's got poor forward flow uh, causing hemodynamic instability. And absolutely that could, I guess, be the case, but all I'm suggesting is that if you're seeing someone 
with this kind of biochemical pattern with background of having possible RV uh, at risk, I'm going to call it. So someone who's a smoker who's got maybe pulmonary hypertension from COPD or something. This picture is obviously coming from a right ventricle. So as you can see, it was diagnosed as pneumonia complicated by non stemming So I'll rush through this one because I know we've got a lot of other cases that we'll, we'll talk through. And so I'm going to give you uh, my thoughts as we were doing this scan. So we did this as soon as she got into the unit. So first thing that we can see is that the right ventricle in this parastone long axis view looks bigger than the left. We are off axis. Okay, you can see that the apex of the left ventricle is coming into show here and the left ventricle looks like a little bit of a nubbin. That tells me that we're off axis. And I did that because I'm trying to demonstrate this stuff at the top. So we've got a heavily trabeculated right ventricle, which suggests that there is a chronic component to the right ventricle dilation, suggesting that she may have some significant underlying uh, pulmonary hypertension. We've got a bit of a thickened RV free wall and a big RV. That RV is bigger than the aorta and bigger than the left atrium, and they should all be about the same size. I've got a left ventricle that's trying really hard to compensate for things, hence my big, horrible sinus tachycardia with rates up to 140. I've got that interventricle septum that's pushed over to the left, a uh, D-shaped septum as we're expecting to see in the short axis view. And the last little tip and trick is this down here. What's, what's that? What am I pointing to there? Coronary sinus, right? Coronary sinus is dilated, suggesting again chronically elevated right atrial pressures, which might point to us again with the rest of it, suggesting that we've got chronically elevated pressures in the right side of the heart. Okay, so straight away, first view, the right heart is the problem that's causing all of those biochemical abnormalities. But if we have an abnormality in one plane, we're going to go and check out others. So short axis being our go-to view to tell us if we've got abnormalities for ventricle size and function. And absolutely, we can see here from the basal views to the mid-ventricle views up towards the apex with the heavy trabeculation is that we're seeing someone with a right ventricle that's twice the size of the left ventricle, uh, the septum being pushed over towards the left, causing a D-shape, particularly during diastole, suggesting a fluid overloaded state. Maybe we could suggest it's systolic as well in some areas, but again, big RV and signs of chronically overloaded pattern. As well as assessing RV size and function with 2D, we've got to have a concept though of, the, of, of getting an idea of context and particularly what the afterload might be. Um, and this is where assessing pulmonary hemodynamics comes in. So we're going to look at pulmonary hemodynamics in two main areas. The first of which can be the pulmonary valve just before there and the right ventricle outflow tract. And we do that in our parasternal long and short views. And we can see here our pulse wave Doppler just before our pulmonary valve giving us this pattern here underneath. So it's pulse wave Doppler, and I'm particularly looking in here at the acceleration time. So that's the amount of time it goes from the beginning to the uh, end of um, contraction, if you like, to the peak pressure. And anything less than 90 is significantly elevated. And also the pattern is W shaped, the flying W pattern. Again, suggesting significant pulmonary hypertension. But having said all that, I'm gonna look at the second thing, which is the tricuspid valve and I look at my tricuspid regurge. And here I'm gonna see that I can look using four V squared to get an estimate of what my peak systolic pulmonary artery pressure here, which is only 20. And of course, I probably don't need to explain to this audience, you stick those two things together, along with a big dilated, badly functioning heart, we can say that this is a gross underestimation probably of what the severity of the pulmonary hypertension is because she's got a right ventricle that's not working well, so it can't generate the pressures. We're going to assess the RV function. So I've said that there's something different about those two pressures, that the, R, the, the tricuspid regurg wasn't very high, and that's because of the RV functions down. So we assess the RV function with TAPSI, with tissue Doppler, that I'm sorry I've forgotten to put on this slide, fractional area change, which is abnormal, subjective assessment. So this is what a badly functioning ventricle looks like. And if we want to get fancy and talk about more research-based side of things, potentially one of the more sensitive ways of assessing the right heart, we could do things like speckle tracking, looking at right ventricle free wall strain. So what do we do next? 
All right, so looking at that picture all together, putting in that context of the horrific hemodynamic instability, the massively escalating inotrope requirements, the fantastically impressive uh, physiological derangements uh, in her biochemistry, and looking at the echo, the next thing we do is a fairly standard approach, I think, is we first of all, we've got to treat the cause. If we think it's infection, we've got to give her antibiotics and we've got to find the source. If you think it's ischemia, you've got to open up a blood vessel if you can. If you think it's a PE, you've got to get rid of the clot. In this case, we thought it was infection, give us some antibiotics, and then we look at protecting the right ventricle. That means with this case here, you've got to remove fluids. You can do that with fruzamide. If that's not working, very quickly move on to dialysis, in my opinion, and just suck fluid off. Make sure you don't cause horrific uh, changes in the urea and um, uh, creatinine too fast and cause electrolyte abnormalities, and that's why using things like scuff might work. So I've certainly uh, got that wrong before. Ventilate appropriately, maybe avoiding really high peeps if you can. Avoiding hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis. So people with ARDS, I don't follow the guidelines and allow permissive hypercarbia. If someone's right ventricle is down, you try and get that carbon dioxide down. Correct the acidosis if it's there. Again, dialysis can help with that. And then consider refractory things like nitric oxide, prostaglandins, probably talk about our vans, you could probably talk about impellers, we could talk about ECMO, we could talk about uh, uh, aortic balloon pumps, and maybe that's for another talk. So I'm just gonna talk about general stuff to begin with, okay? So that's basically in about two minutes, my summary of everything I know about the right ventricle. So mm -hmm. go and look for it if someone think you think they might have it, assess it properly in lots of different views, try and think about the pulmonary hemodynamics at the same time, you have gotta put it all together at the end, try and think about how to deal with it and that's treating the cause and then trying to protect that right ventricle from a fluid, from a catecholamine, and from a ventilation point of view. All right, so we did all that, this is what happened. So this is the echo that I just showed you. You can see the next day her heart rate's much better, the left ventricle's smaller, and there's not so much of that D shape to the septum. And the short axis, again, you can see that right ventricle that was twice the size of the left ventricle is now probably closer to being the same size. Particularly looking at sort of the upper aspect, if you look at the um, mid and the apical level, that is a much happier moving ventricle, and we saw that in all the other parameters, okay? Subcostally, again, showing that you've got a right ventricle that looks much happier in size and function compared to the left ventricle. So the right ventricle can recover quickly if you pull them back from the edge as fast as you can. And I guess that's what this, this slide's meant to show, is that the right ventricle, when it gets to a certain point, can fall off very quickly in terms of increased pressures. And that's why people who have normal RVs, you give them a PE and they can collapse horrifically very quickly with relatively small pulmonary pressures. If you're used to having pulmonary pressures, it's probably not quite as a... Uh, massive drop off, but the right ventricle can fail quickly and on the flip side can recover quickly as well if you get on top of it fast and that's obviously where echo comes in. Um, so I'm just going to put this one out there, we're going to come back to this in a few slides time, but just how common do you think RV dysfunction is among these critically ill patients? You know, if I've just shown this case, uh, you know, I said this from a couple of years ago, have I only seen one of these or is it something that we see all the time? So just Put in your mind, I'm giving you a choice of four, five, 20, 40, or 60%, and I'll show you some evidence that we've got from our unit uh, in just a moment, okay? Just have a think about that. Um, and I put this slide up to, because uh, it makes, again, everything makes me think of the RV, <laughs> and so this made me think of the RV. Yeah, I want you to imagine yourself standing, you know, this is meant to be when you're looking after a patient and you can be thinking everything's going really well, you know, you're standing on the beach with the waves lapping against your feet and everything's hunky-dory there's no rain but if you're not aware of it and you don't think about it in the distance there could be this cloud that can come in and and that's why I think about trying to recognize who the at-risk patients are the ones that you need to stop standing still with your feet lapping in the sand and you need to go and get the echo machine and scan them and those would be people who are at risk factors for pulmonary hypertension so smokers OSA obesity uh, COPD, whatever, you know, lung problems. People, with, people who've got any kind of uh, peripheral signs of edema, 
but relatively clear chests. And I've got, I'm not saying these all cause RB failure, I'm just saying that they might be, so go and have a look for it. If they're in shock with rising lactates, unexplained LFT derangements, unexplained acute renal failure, I think you go and look at the right ventricle, right? So go and grab your Echo Pro, don't give fluid straight away, and go and have a look at them. Because if you miss it, you get in this spiral. I've stolen this from the PE guidelines, but I think it applies to all right ventricles in my opinion. That if you start missing problems, so you're overventilating a patient, or I don't know, there's unrecognized pulmonary hypertension and you intubate them, and you've set the settings wrong or something, you can start to get increased RV afterload, and that opens up the right ventricle, and pretty soon you can get into this spiral where the right ventricle's not working well, it needs to work harder, you're starting to give fluids because maybe you haven't recognized the RV being down, it puts the heart under more stress, and blah, 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 blah. And obviously when you're starting to get to the low cardiac output stage, that's when it starts to get really dangerous. So let me put this out to the group then, looking at this curve. What is the most important thing on that slide, on the basis of what I've said? Catching before the tricuspid valve goes down. No, nice job. So absolutely right. It's the tricuspid valve insufficiencies. And again, I don't have a lot of evidence to back this up, I should say. This is just a personal opinion. The tricuspid valve insufficiency is really important because if you get to a stage where the RV is dilating and it gets to a stage where that tricuspid regurg is getting worse, you start to get into a stage where you can't pull yourself back from the edge because that tricuspid regurg, obviously, if you've got a whole bunch of blood falling into the right atrium, even with all the help in the world, if you're trying to push it forwards, if it's still all falling back into the right atrium, you can actually, with the increased catecholamines and increased activity, you can actually maybe even create increased wall tension and you can increase increased oxygen demand and more ischemia in that right ventricle and worsening contractility. So you've got to try and catch them early and I think fluid balance is essential in these patients. And what I don't know the answer to is how to assess fluid balance very well in these patients because often they're very puffy, often they're normally a bit fluid overloaded and I don't really know how to deal with that. But I do know that we've had patients, like I'll show you towards the end of this, where we've taken off 25 litres of fluid and their hemodynamics have stayed rock solid and nothing's changed. If anything, it's got better with taking off the fluid. So I think that's a really important part of this. And I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I do know it's not giving fluids. So have I got any evidence to back up that the RV is important? Well, of course I do. We've got pulmonary hypertension literature. It's probably one of the largest pulmonary hypertensive uh, trials ever done by a, a guy called Noel Fine and Garvin Kane and J.O., a uh, nice bunch of guys from the States. And they show quite nicely using strain that the worse your right ventricle is, the worse it is for your prognosis uh, in terms of hospital readmissions and uh, you know, other cardiac events like heart attacks and things. And they did that based on RV strain, which is really, really good for pulmonary hypertension. I'm not suggesting we do it on every patient in the ICU, but it's an interesting thing if you're looking to do right ventricle research, uh, it's becoming expected in research. It's much, you know, very commonly used in the pulmonary hypertension literature. If we have someone who's got heart failure, we know the heart failure it predominantly can affect the left heart. If it affects the right heart, or if the left heart failure is so bad, you're getting that pressure over onto the right side. If your right ventricle's down, you're much more likely to have a bad outcome. And the critically ill population, probably one of my favorite studies done that probably got me into ECHO um, uh, about you know, nine years ago properly, which was this one done by uh, various heroes of mine, including people like Amand, uh, Dessap and Antoine Villabaron and Rochard and all those guys. Um, they did this study, I think it was looking in a multi-center study, which again, I think is pretty impressive when uh, trying to do multi-center echo studies. 226 patients, moderate to severe ARDS. Do they have core pulmonale or not? That They're just described as being the septum being pushed over. Um, and they found that if you did have core pulmonale, your mortality was twice as high as if you didn't. And what I took away from that is, if you've got your RV is impaired and you've got ARDS, you're in a lot of trouble. You've got, you're much more likely to die than you're not. Um, and that rings true out of personal experience, I guess, as well. I should add in that the definition of core pulmonale 
um, in this, it's, I, I think the definition of core pulmonale is sometimes used badly. So for me, core pulmonale is a physiological explanation as well as an echo explanation. You've got to have a dilated right ventricle with the inter interventricular septum pushed over, but you've also got to have signs biochemically or clinically of venous congestion. So that's, you know, weird edema or LFTs being out or, um, uh, you know, the kidneys going off. You, it's not just the dilated right ventricle with the septum being pushed over because people with, pulmonary, uh, people with pulmonary hypertension can have that and they're totally fine, right? And I don't think it's right to label them as having core pulmonale. Core pulmonale is like right at the end of that sketch when you, as in that should be the equivalent of us saying someone is in shock, you know? Someone's, you know, not just hypotensive, but you can have someone who's got a bit of a low blood pressure who's not in shock. And I think those are two very different kinds of communication, right? So if someone says core pulmonale to me, that means you've got to stop what you're doing, going have a look at them. If someone says, oh, this patient's a little bit hypotensive, but they're okay, I can probably get away with seeing a patient or two first. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a bad thing. <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, and there's also some pretty dodgy research done by me uh, to show that the right ventricle is bad as well in about, you know, I think this was in 60 patients with sepsis, showing that if your right heart was bad with strain, you're going to die. So what causes your right heart to be impaired? Um, it can be pulmonary hypertension. It can be horrible blood clots. It can be uh, having us on a ventilator, uh, us doing it to someone by putting them on a ventilator for whatever reason. It can be infection, it can be arrhythmias, it can be ischemia. Just saying there are lots and lots of reasons why someone can have a right ventricle being impaired. So what do you need to know for assessment and what do you need to know for the exams? So trying for the, those doing the exams, trying to think of a way to explain this quickly and efficiently is really important because there is going to be a question on the right ventricle in the exam because I get to write it. So it's always going to be a right ventricle question in there. And it's often in a very clinical context, right? So we will give you scenarios and you've got to try and think about that scenario. Think, say how you're going to assess it uh, in entirety and then how you're going to tie it back in together, right? So part of the question, and it's not all, it's not going to be a question of how do you assess the right heart or how do you assess pulmonary hypertension. It's always going to be linked in. It's clinical stuff, right? Um, a lot of it is in this paper. It's a really, I think it's a really good paper to read about the right ventricle, and it goes over a lot of these things I'm about to say. And a basic... Uh, premise that I tried to get when I, I was writing this little bit for it, I talked about how to assess it. And for me, it was trying to link it in with how to assess the left ventricle. That's a bit similar to the left ventricle in terms of you look at its size, and when you're looking at function, you talk about preload, contractility, and afterload. So I tried to sort of put that in the same idea. So first of all, when we're looking at the size, you've got a few ways of assessing it. The first thing is you've got to assess it in all views and you would compare it with the left ventricle. If it's bigger than the left ventricle, it's getting to sort of that mild to moderate category. If it's bigger than the left ventricle, it's getting towards the severe. You've got to have a look at the interventricle septum and see if it's pushed over. And again, we call that ventricular interdependence. And it's a sign of increased pressure or volume of the right ventricle. So increased pressure, pushing that septum over, particularly during systole. And uh, if it's during diastole, that's more of a volume overload. In terms of assessing the size, the, the main one I use is this number C here, where you actually just measure it, and you have the base, you have the mid, and you have the long axis, and that's 42 at the base, 36 at the mid, and 82 up and down. All right? You can measure the area as well. One of the other ways they talk about access, uh, assessing it is the eccentricity index. I don't use it a lot, but if you're doing research, it's a nice way of describing it and giving numeric value. And that's where we do these measurements across the left ventricle, and you compare them as a ratio. And obviously, it should be one to one. Anything less than that would suggest that you've got the axis being out and it's squished and it's an oval shape. Okay, please interrupt me if you've got any questions. Okay. Okay, how about for the assessment of the Function. So the functions, again, it's about assessing the preload, 
contractility and afterload. Most of the time we just talk about the contractility. And one of the things I try to get across in these tutorials is the idea of, I guess it's the idea of clinical context, right? You've got to have an idea about where they are in terms of their fluid status. I think this is really hard with the right ventricle. And you can assess your preload in all the usual ways. So looking at your uh, respiratory variation, if there's no respiratory variation, suggest that you're not fluid responsive, whatever the hell that means. If you are, if you've got a big dilated IVC, which doesn't collapse with a respiration or insufflation, that suggests that you've got uh, maybe on the higher end of that Frank Starling curve. And if you've got big old diffusions around it, you're going to be preventing the heart from being filled. Okay, so context of the preload, have an idea about where you are on the scale and have a pinch of salt because you obviously might be out. But the contractility. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So in terms of assessing the contractility, the first thing is to just use your eyeball. You're gonna have a look, you're gonna be making those measurements of the RV size in all views, and whilst you're doing that, you can have a look how, at how that, how that heart is functioning. So how good are we at doing it? Because it's a start, it's absolutely something you should do, because if you think it's severely abnormal, but all your numbers tell you that it's normal, well, one of them is out and that should cause you to go back and try and assess it because something was wrong. So if your numbers kind of match up, then that gives you confidence. If they don't match up, try and ask yourself why. So we've done a study recently, uh, well, a couple of years ago now, um, trying to look into this about how good we are at doing it because we're all doing it and we should know how good we are. So we took 80, ICU specialists from who are all members of the college who have advanced echo qualifications. And I sent them out 50, I think it was now, 50 images, uh, you know, of 2D images of either three to six clips. And they'd look at those and then they would say whether they thought the uh, RV was normal, mild or moderate or severely impaired. And then I compared this to the two main ways of assessing RV function that we use in terms of RV free wall strain and tapsy. If something is perfectly in agreement, it looks like that, the, this, uh, this graph up here. So big black boxes all along the line is great. And that's excellent. And so what we can see with our two ways that start with the tapsy is the black boxes are not along the line, which suggests that there is some bias involved. So when we compare our assessment to tapsy, we tend to overcall how bad that right ventricle is versus tapsy. I don't know which one is better compared to MRI or something, but I'm just saying that when you look at something and you say it's severely abnormal, often the tapsy can be less, all right? You can also see the big black boxes are pretty small, which means that we're not always in exactly the same agreement in terms of those categories. As in, if I say it's severely abnormal, and tapsy is severely abnormal, we, that, that's not happening all the time. The gray box is if you're one category out. So more often than not, we were one category out. We weren't always hugely out with each other. But there was some bias involved when we were looking at TAPSI. What was interesting to me is that we were much more likely to have agreement, not always exactly in the same category though, when we were doing it with RV free wall strain. So I think RV free wall strain is explaining more to us about what our eye sees. Okay, it's more in agreement with what our eye sees. But I guess what I'm taking away from this, and maybe I'll, I'll talk more about the research another time, but basically it's, it's okay. When you look at an RV and you say that it's mildly impaired, and I look at it and I say it's mildly impaired maybe, it's okay. It's, it's, it's a fairly reliable, I said, way of assessing it, but it is not perfect, all right? So that's why we need to go and assess it with other things, such as the old favorite TAPSI, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, Put the end mode down through that lateral annulus when you're in your apical four chamber view. We're assessing how far that annulus goes towards the apex, okay? And it's pretty good at assessing it. It isn't perfect, okay? What we use is we use the end mode to then look from the bottom of the humps to the top of the humps, and anything greater than 16 we say is normal. Anything less than 16 we say is abnormal. And in studies that compare this to MRI as the reference standard, it's not too bad. And I don't know, does someone want to tell me why? Why is TAPSI okay? Because it's such a, the RV is such a weird shape. Why is it so good for doing it? 
and it's not as good as map C. Does anyone have a crack? Beautiful, it's the longitudinal fibers because 85% of the right ventricle is made up of longitudinal fibers, which means that the majority of the motion of the systolic function, we think, comes from the longitudinal motion of the right ventricle. And I've got, again, some interesting studies that to suggest that maybe that's not the case. But again, maybe that's to talk for another time, because maybe it's actually all about the septum. But again, talk for another time. So um, is there any data that shows that the lower your taxi is the worse your RV function is? Say that again. So if you've got... Shows the lower your taxi is, so 14, 12, 10, that correlates to like the MRI or something else about... It's never been done versus MRI. It has been done versus strain. And it does match up, and it is far from perfect. And what was interesting, again, it's a little bit researchy, but I'll show you the data. We compared strain and TAPSI yeah. about where it kind of matched up. And it's really interesting. It is not, it's not perfect. And if, you know, if the strain is done right, then maybe the strain is better at picking it up. It's interesting. Um, okay, so TAPSI is the first one. That's part of every study that uh, I think you should do, uh, including the focus studies. The rest of it is a bit more advanced. So next one is tissue Doppler. So that's where we look at the speed at which that annulus is moving. And that is, again, it's easy to do, it's relatively quick. It's probably the worst out of all of them when they're compared in studies versus the MRI. Uh, and you use about a value, depending on which uh, books you read, of 8.5 or 10 centimeters a second. But definitely up around that high single figure number is normal, low single figure numbers are abnormal, all right? The problems are, again, it's angle dependent, so you've got to be making sure your yeah, the cursor line is directly through the apex. Um, and it's, it's okay. It's, I'll use it if there are uh, very bad images. Now, this is one of my faves, um, and it's vastly underutilized probably. So the fractional area change in your apical four chamber, and you don't have to be completely on axis, but you've got to try and be... Uh, in line, I guess, with the center of the heart. So you've got to be down the gun barrel of that ventricle. You measure it at end systole and end diastole. And you're comparing the, and comparing the areas. And a normal fractional area change is about 32 to 35%. So it should be, it should decrease by 35% or so. The good thing is, is that it, this, where the other ones were all sort of angle dependent and they're just looking at a single point, the problem with anything that relies on a single point to assess a big structure's function is that it can be subject to tethering. As in, if you've got a part of the heart that's not moving, but another part is, it can still be pulled up. Whereas with fractional area change, it will often account for that. And it's maybe a little bit better at picking up areas where you've got some kind of regional wall motion abnormality. And we frequently see that in pulmonary hypertension. So it's one of the things, if I'm looking at a heart and I think it's bad, but the tapsy is normal, the next one I'll do will be this. I don't do it in all patients. I only do it when my taxi and my visual assessment don't really match up. So it's, 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 uh, it's another just tool in the bag. So let me show you this case. So this is an example of that. Right, so 68 year old lady, short of breath, big old PE, okay? If you look at the bottom picture, first of all, in the subcostal one, you can see that the right ventricle looks the biggest, the left ventricle, if not a little bit bigger. But that, that annulus is moving pretty well. Okay? When you look up at the top right one, I should have put a normal one underneath just so that you can see that that one is moving okay, but this part here isn't. And as I said, that's really common in pulmonary hypertension. And people with pulmonary hypertension can get PE still, right? So you can often see you know, maybe this is someone who doesn't have the McConnell sign that we classically see in PE, but this is an RV that is not working well. When I did my TAPSI, I got a TAPSI of 21, right? So I guess this is where your, my eye was the first thing I did, saying that's markedly abnormal. The TAPSI is normal. You go, whoa, hang on a sec, that's not right. And that's because the TAPSI is just looking at one little point, right? So if you go back with your fractional area change, your fractional area change can back it up, suggesting that we're at least got some moderate impairment going on. And that's where I'd say I'm going to ignore the TAPSI. I'm going with my eyeball on the fractional area change and the clinical story of a 68-year-old lady who's probably got some pulmonary hypertension, who's got a PE. This, you know, the, the 
conclusion would be this is an RV potentially at risk. This would be someone who, if they were symptomatic and syncopal and stuff, this is someone who's fitting into a sub massive PE category or high risk category that we got to think about other endeavors that are maybe a bit more aggressive. And I don't, again, have a lot of evidence on that, but it's just the way to start to think, right? Yeah. So question, see how the apex isn't moving very much, it's mm. just rotating with yeah, the nice. left ventricle coming in. Are you saying that's part of chronic pulmonary hypertension? It's often seen in pulmonary hypertension, often so seen in pulmonary hypertension, yeah. Is that, does that mean that she had a relatively greater proportion of chronic hypertension and that's why she didn't get the pulmonary side? Absolutely, absolutely, I think that's exactly right. But I don't know how much is contributed by the pulmonary hypertension and how much would be contributed by a PE, for example. I don't know the answer to that. All I'm saying is that from the echo, and I saw that, the, the risk is, is that I call the RV function as normal and report the echo and send her on her way and just say, fine with heparin, don't worry about it. As opposed to what I did with this where I said, oh, this is a dilated right ventricle, we've got moderate impairments, as in it's not even normal, it's gone past normal, it's moderately impaired. And this would be a phone call to the respiratory specialist to say, this is an RV at risk. Or if I was looking after the patient, and maybe the heparin is just fine. Maybe that's what we should just do if the patient's not got sats of 80 and not hypotensive. I'm just saying this is an RV to me that's at risk. Yeah, no, I'm, but I've kind of focused on one aspect, being the, the lack of movement of the mm. apex with pulmonary hypertension. Do we know why? No. I just know there's a, a, a really amazing sonographer called Leia Wright, who works with Tom Myrick oh, yeah. down in... Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she did the study where she looked at loads of pulmonary hypertension and loads of PE patients and found, with, with strain, and found that this was really common in the pulmonary hypertension. That's where I've got that. That's from. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we know why. Because it's weird, it's the other way around the PE. I'll put a copy to that in the folder if anyone's interested. Um, I'll quickly just skip over this. Maybe we'll do this for another talk sometime. I, I don't think this is, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be standard stuff, but I think it's quite interesting. So speckle tracking is the last way you can assess that right ventricle. Uh, basically the software just latches onto the little speckles in the myocardium, which actually are pretty stable during the cardiac cycle. It locks on and it looks how they come together and separates during um, the cardiac cycle, okay? So they look a bit like that. The, the software grabs them and looks how they change relative to each other. And we talk about strain, which is, I, I wish they'd use a different term because we talk about RV strain if the RV is at risk. And then I start talking about strain with RV speckle tracking and uh, people get confused. But strain is, the, is a sign of deformation. So if you start at 100% and you go down to 75%, that is, that's a negative value because it changes in a smaller way. And it's, so that would be strain or a deformation of minus 25%. That's what the RV is, that's normal. All right, it works well for the same reasons as TAPSI because all the uh, fibers are longitudinal. Uh, and that's what's shown here in the, uh, in sort of the green here. To do the imaging, you've got to go in a slightly different kind of imaging. Um, and just in the meaning of time, maybe I'll leave this for another talk to give to you on speckle tracking. And just, if this is the apical four chamber view, just slide around a bit. And then you get the software, you paint the wall and watch how the things move. And you get pretty curves and pretty pictures and it's really good for publishing work. Okay, so this is what we did in this group of patients. So we had uh, about 50, uh, I think we did it in about 50 or 60 patients. And we looked to see how much, and these were all ventilated patients with a PF ratio less than 300. So again, just a kind of bog standard cohort of ventilated patients in the ICU, okay? Uh, and the answer to that is it, how much do we see? Well, when I use strain, I saw a bunch. So look at these ones down at the bottom. So if we've got normal being one, two being mild to moderate, and three being severe, when I'm using strain, I found out that 60% of the patients who were being mechanically ventilated had some form of impaired right ventricle. And I think that's a really sensitive way of picking it up. So maybe it's a little bit too sensitive, you might say. But if you just want to use bog standard TAPSI, again, we're seeing a quarter of the patients had RV dysfunction based on TAPSI, which is not perfect, but it's okay versus MRI. It's really easy to do. And just a, an average cohort, these aren't ones I was looking for RV dysfunction, just those on a ventilator, 25% of TAPSI. 
So I guess my, what I took away from that is, I don't know, people say I talk about the RB too much. I'm suggesting maybe I don't talk about it enough. You know, it's happening all the time out there. We've got to go looking for it. Um, context is everything. You've got to have a idea of what the pulmonary hemodynamics are. Uh, to assess the pulmonary hemodynamics, you look at your tricuspid regurg jet, you look at the peak Vmax of it, and you add on the right atrial pressure that you can estimate from the IVC. If you can't see the IVC, there's also some data out there to suggest just add on five. And it's pretty good. And versus pulmonary artery catheters, that is pretty good if you know what you're doing. And I think you know what you're doing if you've done about 50 to 75 full studies. Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah. Sorry. What do you do when there's not enough tricuspid regurg? Can't use it. Oh, so, you can. Obviously, you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, if you haven't got that, I'll show you. You can use another value. You can use the acceleration time, but I think that's a bit rubbish. So, you can use bubbles. Yeah, good cool. You can yeah. use bubbles and use the jet. So, they talk about and that can be just uh, ordinary agitated saline. That might help the tricuspid regurg get a bit bigger. I normally just can't. If there's not a whole bunch of tricuspid regurg, so it's just, you know, but normally I think if an RB is at risk, you're going to get some kind of tricuspid regurg, I reckon, don't you reckon? Um, there are potential pitfalls to this, right? So it's easy to bugger this up. You've got to get the tracing right. And so the tracing right, first of all, you get that baseline at the top of the image. You make sure you've only got three cardiac cycles. You make sure your Doppler alignment is uh, in line with the direction of the tricuspid regurg jet. We talked all about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about those pearls and pitfalls of doing a full study. And then the last thing is, is making sure you get the gain right. You're looking for the modal velocity, which is where the majority of the blood flow is going. You don't care about the chaotic excess motion of the couple of blood cells in there. And that means you just turn down the gain. So here we can see with the gain super high, I've got values up to 90. But I think when you turn down the gain and you do it properly, we're getting values that are closer to 50, okay? And so they talk about that trying to avoid the fuzz or you know, ignore the fuzz or go for the chin, not the beard. I always think of this picture, which is of the cute cat in the sunlight. You don't wanna be measuring the outside of the cat. This cat is not fat, he's just fluffy. You, if you poked your finger in it, you'd have to go through an inch of fur before you got to the cat's skin. So ignore the fuzz. Get your Doppler angle right. Don't use findings in isolation. It's all about context. That's clinical as well as echo context. Try and measure it in the same phase of the respiratory cycle each time. So I always go for end expiration and spontaneously breathing patients. I probably do end inspiration with those mechanically ventilated because it's easier to hear, I find. Uh, and ensure you've got an accurate Doppler trace. And as I said, Danny, avoid incomplete traces because they can confuse the picture. Um, if you're talking about right atrial pressure, as I, I, I say to try and be accurate, you can use both the IVC and the hepatic veins, but uh, there's also, as I said, evidence out there to say, bugger all of this and just add on five, <laughs> and particularly if they're mechanically ventilated. Um, but if you do want to do it accurately, uh, which I encourage you to do, image the hepatic veins. That will also tell you if you've got severe TR as well, if you've got hepatic vein systolic reversal. Okay. So this is what a pattern might look like. So if you've got systolic greater than diastolic, it's about five. If systolic equals diastolic, it's maybe closer to 10. Blunting, 15. No systolic forward flow, it's 20 or above. And that's uh, used a lot in pulmonary hypertension literature. Okay, one of my faves is the pulmonary acceleration time and the RVOT trace. So the pulmonary acceleration time, as we were saying at the beginning, if it's less than 90, that is a sign of significantly elevated pulmonary vascular resistance in particular. And you're just making a measurement from the beginning of the RVOT trace to the top. Okay? Less than 90 bad. Less than, uh, greater than 120 normal in the middle, who knows? More importantly than that though, it's this wave-like pattern. Okay, it's this, so normal has got this kind of parabolic uh, shape, Whereas pulmonary hypertension's got that notching, right? 
And that's, again, a sign of significant pulmonary hypertension. You can use this waveform pattern to try and estimate what the mean pulmonary artery pressure is. And you do that by 79 minus 0.45 times acceleration time. I, I don't know about that. I think that sounds like someone's made that up from comparing it. Someone's got a nice paper that's published from that. I, I don't know, I don't do that, I think. But you can do it. Uh, I think probably there are better things to do with the time though. Um, and the last one would be the VTI. So a VTI, you can trace out that uh, pulse wave Doppler profile and anything greater than 15 or 16 is normal. Okay. I might leave it at that rather than, because I know Hatim's got a great case that he might want to show, and we'll talk about some of the monitoring another time. Hatim said he's got a great case of someone with significant pulmonary hypertension, and we'd love to hear from you, Hatim, rather than to hear me rabbiting on if you're up for it. Yeah, so I just thought here today, and uh, I found a case that... I'll let you have the screen. Uh, um, Hatim, sorry, before we carry on, there is the... Uh, the things are anonymized, aren't they? There's no patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yep. you. All right. I think whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. So this is a patient that uh, I inherited that had been ventilated here for the last two days. And let me just get us. Thanks for doing the case. No worries. If anyone would like to do one in the future, please, it's, uh, you're more than welcome. As long as everything's anonymized, of course, because we're recording this and putting it up on the website. Okay, can you see my screen or not yet? Not yet. Okay, share my screen. We can see you, Hatton, but not your screen. Do it with interpretive dance. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Any joy? Okay, check like this. Can you see my screen? Yes, we're on. Yep, perfect. Okay. So this is a patient that I inherited. He's ventilated uh, for the last 24 hours, presented with what looked like community acquired pneumonia. And the uh, point of shoot, I got a very small sonocyte that uh, I decided to have a look and find out what's happening. He's having this history of uh, smoking, but no formal diagnosis of COPD. The scale is up to 3.5. I got it up here. So it's 3.8. Can I just ask everyone to note how Hatem is recording that tricuspid regurgitation? jet? You'll notice that he slid a little bit more anteriorly. He used color Doppler to figure out the perfect direction. So his Doppler angle is absolutely in line with it. And that's how he's got a trace that he feels more confident to use. Uh, so it's a really good example of some off axis imaging there. So yeah, nice, nicely done that. That's his subcostal. So again, he had got this big pericardial infusion as well with even a little bit of early signs of uh, right atrial collapse. I'm not sure whether it's clearly obvious on your screens. But RV is not collapsing, it's just uh, a little bit of the RA. That's his IVC is 2.6 without any collapse. And that got some reversal of his uh, uh, hepatic veins flow. It's not the proper angle, but uh, it was just a quick point of shoot sort of thing. Do you mind going back on Hatton? There's a nice little sign on the one before. So just looking for the red on the hepatic vein was enough to tell us that we've got systolic flow. Yeah, that one. Exactly, just, yeah. If everyone notices that red that's coming back every now and again, mm -hmm. that should make again make you think, oh, I've got to go and do my pulse wave Doppler uh, because I've got some kind of systolic flow going back and that's probably from the severe TR. Exactly, yeah. And here is it. So yeah, I think uh, it's a nice case and uh, demonstrating all the signs of the 
pulmonary hypertension. It's not particularly showing severe RV dysfunction, so RV is still relatively functioning. At least it will be mildly impaired, but definitely having a constellation of many things together. And different dilatation as well as the trabeculations on the top bit, which means it's more likely to be chronic with uh, RV free wall as well taken. Yeah, it's interesting to know that maybe uh, the, when you've got that thickened RV free wall, maybe that sort of prevents some of the tamponade physiology coming out sometimes. So it's like protective. So sometimes it can be high pressure uh, tamponade sort of thing if it happens. So did because you, did you drain the effusion? What did you decide to do? No, uh, for time being, his hemodynamics are holding, so it would be weaning from ventilation. The maximum uh, diameter is like 18 millimeters, so it's still at yeah. least moderate effusion. But for the time being, I'd hold and, uh, unless his hemodynamics would get compromised. Did you see a dilated um, uh, coronary sinus? Is the parasternal long axis view there? Just it's starting to come in on that view. I was just wondering what the... Was it dilated? I was just wondering whether the... What, what do you think the cause of the effusion is? Is it related to infection or...? I think it's more likely related to the... RV. Chronic, uh, yeah, chronic RV dysfunction. No. Because he had got bilateral pleural effusions as well. Well, that's, that's fascinating. Hey, thanks for showing that case. I got another patient for another time, low flow aortic stenosis. Perfect. That's, uh, absolutely. We're going to be doing aortic stenosis, I think, in a couple of weeks. We'll start working through the valves um, and I'll try and get someone else to talk. Yep. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you all very, very much for joining. Are there any questions or comments um, before we go? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much for joining. Would you do that? If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.